Hello, Dr. Joel here again, and today we're going to look at something different. We're going to look at making measurements on a mixer with a very low output IF frequency. It's going to go down to 100 kilohertz, and that's a little difficult to do with the PNAX because the internal couplers roll off. So we're going to use an ENAX, which goes down to 100 kilohertz, and use external couplers, uh, or actually external bridges, that allow us to go very low in frequency. So let's get started. Hello, I'm Dr. Joel, and I'm uh, in the lab today. We're going to be looking at the ENAX today, making a measurement on a mixer with a very low frequency IF. It'll have an output of 100 kilohertz to um, 50 megahertz, and we're trying to look at the frequency response and especially the group delay of this frequency converter. It's a little tough to do that with a PNA that stops at 10 megahertz, so we're going to switch to the ENAX, and we're going to be doing something special with this. We're going to be using external couplers. The ENAX allows external couplers to be used with the direct receiver access. So we're going to be looking at that today. So for today's measurement, we're going to use the SMC measurement class. I've already got it set up. You can see the measurement class right here. Scalar con uh, mixer converter plus phase. I was one of the development engineers on this uh, maybe 10 years ago. And it was developed for the PNA. We're going to use it on the ENAX now. And when we look at the setup, I always work from right to left. Um, we first set up the uh, mixer configuration. Port one will be the input. Port two will be the output. The yellow will be port three. And I've got my mixer power, LO power set to 10 dBm. My mixer frequencies, I wanna measure from 100 kilohertz to 500 megahertz, 50 megahertz. And uh, I'll have a 1.565 local oscillator. So that means the input frequency will be from uh, 1.5651 gigahertz to 1.615 gigahertz. And power level I've got set to minus 15, that's 25 dB below the yellow drive level. That's typically a good level for a linear mixer operation. And finally, I'm gonna choose the linear sweep. I've got 500 points, which means I'll be 100 kilohertz per division. And I've got a 10 kilohertz IF bandwidth. At 100 kilohertz, that might be a little wide, but I think it'll be okay and I will Normalize my phase measurements to the middle point. Say OK. So let's auto scale this. And yes, it's a frequency conversion. I've got a roll off right around, it's around 30 megahertz. I know that's the corner frequency of my converter I have set up here today. Um, and I also like to check and make sure that the noise behavior looks as I expect it to look. So let's uh, do this little trick. We'll do normalize. It puts data into memory and data over memory. And I'll set my reference value back to zero. And I'll put my scale at point, let's go uh, one degree per division. And I will turn off the averaging. So without any averaging, that looks pretty good. Of course, here I'm in the noise region and the amplitude response is quite small. Let's switch over to the phase response. Again, I'm normalizing the trace. and Let's go down to one degree per division. And I see a bit of variation. And this is typical of the ENAX. Uh, the older PNAs had almost the same behavior. The newer PNAs have a DDS source that's got much, much lower phase noise. But uh, we're working with the ENA now, so the way we get around that is we just add averaging to the measurement. And so you can see as I average more and more, the trace stabilizes really nicely. And my goal is less than one degree variation across the trace. And clearly I have it. I'm around 0.1 degree variation. And I can always kick the averaging factor up higher. And finally, let's look at the group delay. And I'll scale the group delay down to uh, one nanosecond per division. And I am getting down in that one nanosecond per division result, um, even less. So that looks pretty good. So this setup is a reasonable setup and I'll use this uh, setup to start my calibration. A key thing we're gonna be using today is external bridges. These are uh, external bridges, sometimes they're called couplers because they're an uneven bridge. So they have about a 16 dB coupling factor across here and they've got about a 1.5 dB insertion loss. These are actually the bridges that I designed back in around 1986 for the uh, 8753 test set, 8750047A. And uh, you can get an identical bridge in terms of performance using the 86205A, I'll show you a a picture of that I'll insert that and 
this is connected for the reference coupler and the test coupler to the reference input and the test input on port 2. So external bridges using the external direct receiver access inputs here. Port 1 will be my RF port. It will be about 1565 megahertz. And then I'll use this cable here. Uh, coming back over for the local oscillator, that's where I'll use the third port of the ENAX. Let's see how we set this up for the external coupler. In the setup, we have to go to the internal hardware page. And we have to go to the RFIF configuration. And I'll go to the receiver configuration. And in the receiver, um, because I'm using the internal couplers on port 1, I want to reduce the attenuation so I get lower noise. But on the A2 and B2 receivers, I'm using the external couplers, and they're going to have a, a pretty reasonably high signal all the way down to 100 kilohertz. So I'm going to leave those alone. In the source, I actually, this is port 1, and we're going to be using the internal couplers. Um, but for port 2, I've switched this switch to go to the um, external R2 input and the external B input. And with those two external inputs, I can al allow me to do a directional coupler. And this will become the source going into the external pair. And I'll, but for my calibration purposes, I'm actually going to drop the IF bandwidth to 1 kilohertz. And I think I'm going to keep the averaging on at 10 averages. So let's start the calibration process. First step of the calibration, we'll set up the smart cal. And this is the mixer measurement. I'm going to use a known mixer. I already pre-measured that mixer and it has a known uh, delay of about 2.58 nanoseconds. And next. And then I've set up my uh, calibration, male, and female and male, because that matches the mixer type. I'm using an eCal. And let's take a look at that eCal. The eCal I'm going to use is this uh, Keysight N4691B. It's a DC to 26 gigahertz. This is one of our uh, units that actually I worked on uh, uh, helping them to characterize the low frequency behavior of this. So it'll go all the way down to DC. And then later on I'm going to use a power sensor. And again, I need a DC coupled. Most of them go down to 10 megahertz. This is a uh, new USB sensor, the U8489A. And uh, yes, one of the advantages of Keysight is you can find lots of different things around uh, when I work here. So this one happens to be the only DC one I had conveniently available, and it's a DC to 120 gigahertz power sensor. So I've had to adapt it, and at these really low frequencies, those adapters don't make any difference. So that will get me all the way down to DC for the power step. And here's my calibration mixer. We're going to take a first step of using the power meter. So let's go do the power meter step. So we set up the power meter. I always like to make sure the power meter is available. So we'll go look at, see that it's available. It is. And we'll want to zero the power meter uh, before we do the measurements. This is especially important on power meters that have a, uh, a thermal sensor where they have a noise floor of minus 35 dBm. You really need to use them at least 10 dB above the floor, preferably 15 dB above the noise floor because that's the noise floor of the sensor. If you're measuring at that low level, you won't get a good measurement. Start the power meter calibration. It's a little bit slow in the power calibration, so I'll pause here while it uh, does the calibration. First, it's going to calibrate at the input frequencies, so it knows the receiver response at the input frequencies, and then it's going to calibrate port 1 at the output frequencies, even though port 1 won't be producing a signal at the output frequencies for the normal measurement. We're going to use the calibration of port 1, power calibration, to calibrate the receiver response at port 2. So that'll get, a, get us our absolute power calibration, and that's how we get the magnitude response of the converter. And now that it's finished, that's going to ask us for an S-parameter calibration. So we'll have to set up the eCal and go do the S-parameter calibration. Here I've connected the eCal, so let's go ahead and tighten it down. Start the measurement, and because I had averaging on when I uh, started the calibration process, it'll actually average the calibrations. Probably not necessary, but um, 
I like to do a little bit of extra averaging during the calibration. It just makes the calibration cleaner. There it's all finished and the next and final step is to connect the calibration mixer between port 1 and port 2. So let's do that. And the final step is to connect our calibration mixer. I've previously characterized this mixer um, and filter combination so I know what the uh, group delay is. I actually use the PNAX at a higher frequency to calibrate and characterize its delay as a fixed delay number. Because what we're going to do is measure the delay of this mixer and because we know it's delay, it's 2.58 nanoseconds, so we'll make whatever the delay we measure on the overall system equal to that delay value. Finally, we'll tighten everybody up. Okay, and now it's going to set up a mixer measurement and it's going to measure the frequency response of the mixer. And one of the things that's a little unusual about this measurement is you can see it's kicked up the averaging factor to an, a number of 40. Uh, it kicks up the averaging factor to at least 10 if you have no averaging factor turned on. And then if you do have an averaging factor, it kicks up the averaging factor by a factor of 4. This will give us the phase response of the mixer. It doesn't affect the amplitude response at all. It's only used to characterize, really, it's used to characterize the phase response of the ENAX system. And what we're measuring here is a combination of the phase response of the calibration mixer plus the ENAX system. We know the phase response of the uh, calibration mixer and back that out and that gives us the phase response of the system. User cal set number six, so sixth time I've measured this calibration mixer. So from 100 kilohertz to um, two megahertz, we're barely moving one degree across the response of that calibration mixer. So next thing we'll do is we'll put in the test mixer and see how that looks. So here's now my low frequency text mixer. It has much lower corner frequency and uh, narrower band pass filter or low pass filter on the end of it. So we'll go ahead and put that on. And we'll want to restart the averaging. Take a look first at the log magnitude response. You can see this mixer has a very flat response. It's only 5 dB insertion loss. And uh, let me turn off the marker statistics now. Out to 20 megahertz, it's within, flat within 1 dB, so that's a really nice response on the mixer. Let's go take a look at the group delay response, and we'll auto scale that. See, we have a very nice smooth response. It's running around 24 nanoseconds, down to 23, and then, so it has a little bit of corner here, and then it comes up and has the classical peak that you see in the mixture delay measurements on these systems to get to get down to about 100 picoseconds of jitter or variation on the group delay uh, for a measurement like this it's not unusual to use 100 or even 500 averages and the final thing is what if we wanted to save some of this traces so we can add some new traces let's add an s11 trace and an s22 trace and we'll say okay and then we might want to add in another window new traces Add another SC21. We'll set that format to delay and we'll scale that automatically. And now we have the amplitude response, the delay response. Let's add one more new trace. Another SC21 trace. And we'll make that format phase. And now we can go ahead and save all that data into a CSV file if we want. So and what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to save the CSV file format so I can look at it in Excel. I'm going to have all the displayed traces. I'm going to have them in the displayed format. That'll save it as a CSV file. Save. And that's all there is to it. Last thing I wanted to talk about. So let's go back and trigger the measurements. Because I'm using an external coupler, we don't have a low frequency corner in these couplers, but the internal couplers do. And there's a tricky thing that the software does by default. You see it says low frequency auto bandwidth. When you turn this on, it makes the low frequency data much, much narrower bandwidth. So watch how 
fast those averaging factors increase. Because we're starting at 10 kilohertz, it's going to try to narrow that bandwidth to keep the same signal to noise. A couple of roll-offs like 40 dB, so it's going to narrow it by a factor of like 10,000 on the first point. So normally we might have one point at 100 kilohertz, one point at 10 megahertz, and go up to 40 gigahertz. So only the first point takes the uh, hit for time. But now we have all these points below the corner frequency. And it actually changes the effective bandwidth as it moves up. So the first point might be 1 hertz, the middle point it might be 100 hertz, and at the end, po end points here it might be 10 kilohertz. All right, so that completes our topic today, low frequency, frequency converter measurements.